Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, it's our great pleasure to have uh, Sudip Tap here uh, to give us a talk on wireless, uh, wireless network coding for multi, uh, multiple unicar sessions. Uh, Subdeep get his bachelor degree uh, from IIT and come to U.S. in 1997. Uh, he gets uh, his master from MIT and then uh, go to uh, the Bell Laboratories of Lucent Technology. Uh, he also get a PhD from MIT recently, and uh, um, in this talk, he was uh, talking about uh, how to do network coding uh, with routings uh, in the wireless network. Without further ado, please uh, start the talk. Thank you, Chin. Uh, uh, as Chin said, I'm currently at Bell Labs. Uh, uh, this is a problem I'm looking at. Uh, very recently, uh, and I'm new to the area of network coding. Uh, the work uh, here is joint with uh, Shravan Rancho and Suman Banerjee at University of Wisconsin, and will appear in Infocom 2007. Uh, so here, uh, so wireless network coding. It's another technique to improve throughput in wireless mesh networks. Uh, I'll talk about a very specific scheme that uh, came out of MIT uh, Dina Katabi's group called COPE, and it appeared at uh, SICCOM 2006 and earlier in Allerton 2005. Uh, so about uh, one third to half of the talk, I'll introduce the scheme. And then uh, the motivation behind the work is uh, the results they obtained are on an experimental mesh network uh, testbed. So when I first looked at the paper, found the scheme interesting, first of all, because it's practical. It's because it's a uh, unicast. A lot of the work in network coding is for multicast. Uh, uh, so the interesting question I asked myself is, is there a way to put a theoretical framework around it? Uh, and uh, predict uh, what is the throughput uh, with network coding uh, that could agree with what they have obtained. So the, uh, the focus is on wireless mesh networks, uh, uh, which could be your community mesh networks within a neighborhood. Uh, it could be the last stop access network. So uh, the, the configuration is static. We're not concerned about mobility issues here. And there are no power constraints. The box, the access routers here are typically connected to lamp posts, or they are within your home. And the requirement is for high th throughput. You would like to run a variety of applications, you know, browsing the internet, video, and so on. So brief introduction to network coding. Uh, most of you are uh, working in the area. Uh, it's a relatively new area. Started in 2000, uh, so we are used to uh, the IP routing world. You know, some of us working uh, uh, from uh, in routing for ISP networks. You store the packet, look up the packet's destination, and send it to the next stop, and so on. What uh, the Alswith paper showed is you can process packets uh, in the middle of the network, mix them. Uh, and obtain uh, uh, capacities which are unachievable by uh, normal traditional routing. So here is a simple example for multiple unicast sessions. And it's very similar to the multicast example also. You have two connections. All link capacities or demands are unit 1. You want to send one unit from S1 to T1 and one unit from S2 to T2. So if you do traditional routing, here is a path, the red path here from S1 to T1, and the gray path from S2 to T2. So you can see the link AB becomes the bottleneck. So uh, if I define throughput as 
the fraction of the whole matrix I can draw, throughput is half because of this bottleneck link here. Instead, uh, if you are allowed to mix packets, the router at A, instead of sending A and B separately, it uh, does a bitwise XOR and sends the packet and it can be, and it actually also sends A separately to T2. Uh, so, you can recover here because you know A and A plus B is recover B. Similarly, here you can recover A and you can see here the link is no longer uh, re restricting the throughput. You can achieve a throughput of 1. So it's a very simple example. Uh, now, a lot of the work for network coding is for the wired networks. A lot of it is also for multicast traffic. So, what is interesting about this recent scheme called COPE, uh, it exploits the broadcast nature of the wireless medium. So, if you have a wireless mesh network, uh, you have omnidirectional antennas, uh, you uh, do a broadcast, but if you are sending your uh, broadcast to one intended next stop, you know other guys are keeping quiet. So, they can potentially overhear and make use of the broadcast in nature. Scope tries to exploit that. And the papers appeared in Allerton last year and SICCOM this year. Uh, so, let me uh, talk about the two main mechanisms in which uh, COPE is uh, doing uh, network coding. First one, uh, if you want to send packets from 1 to 3 and 3 to 1, and you do traditional routing, you have four transmissions, uh, two from each of the source nodes and two from the middle node, and they are transmitting separately. That's the, uh, on the left hand side here. Now, if you do network coding, uh, you receive two packets A and B at 2. Instead, you can, uh, instead of sending them separately, you can XOR and send A plus B out. And you can see that node 1 already has packet A because it sent it out. So, you can do the XOR with A, XOR, B and recover B. Similarly, node 3 can recover A. So, that's uh, the simplest form. And th this uh, particular way of utilizing the broadcast medium has been considered in Wu Cho and Kung, uh, they call it physical piggybacking. Okay. And they talk about how to have packets in the buffer, how to combine the packets and so on. So, here this, uh, this mechanism relatively straightforward. You are looking at flows which uh, crisscross each other. Now, there is a second interesting mechanism in COPE which utilizes opportunistic uh, overhearing or opportunistic listening. So, there let me again give an example. Uh, here you have uh, four nodes, north, east, west, south and the middle node. Uh, all the, the f two flows are east, west and two flows are north, south in each direction. So, in traditional routing, uh, each of the source nodes will make one transmission, that's four. And the middle node will send on each to the next stops, so eight transmissions. Uh, now, here uh, when one is transmitting, if four is a neighbor of 1, it can overhear the packet transmission of A, because it has to keep quiet anyway because of interference. So, when the four packets A, B, C, D reach 2, uh, the, uh, the no packet A is also at 4 and 5. So, if you look at node 1, it has packet A because it sent it out and it has also C and D. So, if now the node 2 does a simple broadcast of all four packets, exhorting all four packets and broadcasting, then each of the individual uh, guys, they can recover their uh, packet which was intended for them. So, one is receiving XOR of A, B, C, D. Uh, it has A because it sent it out. It has C and D through overhearing, so it can recover B, the packet from 3. Uh, so, here we are saving three transmissions out of original 8. That's significant, 37%. So, the mechanism here I will call opportunistic listening. Uh, that's what they call it in the paper. So, to formally uh, define the scheme, uh, the, re the restriction is to a very simple family of uh, codes, XOR, but uh, there is no upper bound on how many packets you can code. That's unlimited depending on the opportunity degree of the node and so on. So, if you have uh, native packets, P1, P2 up to PK, you exhort them and P is called a coded packet. So, a packet can be either native or coded. Uh, 
Now, the coding scheme itself is opportunistic and it uses uh, uh, information on packets in the local queues. So, as in the core paper, the decisions are made locally. There is no global coordination required. And, and the, the mesh network, the deskbed, they have in COPE, they have introduced a coding layer between the routing and MAC layers. So, both the routing and MAC layers are oblivious of the coding layer. So, as a result, the routing is not aware of coding opportunities. It is oblivious. So, they do routing based on ETT metric or ETX, ETX metric, one of them. The important observation here is routing is independent of coding. Now, again, so let me formally uh, say the coding rule here. Suppose I am a node and I have n packets uh, to transmit, P1 to Pn. When can I XOR all these n packets? Suppose packet Pi is going to next stop Ri. Now, I can XOR all these packets only if each intended next hop can recover the packet. So, it should ha have the other n minus 1 packets. So, for example, next hop r i should have all n minus uh, 1 packets p j for j not equal to i. That is uh, the rule for uh, coding a packet. Now, th the point now is how can a, a neighbor node r i have packet p j? What are the possible ways? First possible way is packet pj was forwarded by node ri. So, pj was the previous hop of node ri. And the second mechanism is the opportunistic listening that packet pj was overheard by node ri during its previous transmission. Okay. Now, clearly it came from the next hop that I know, but how do I know whether it overheard or not? So, that is that knowledge is obtained in COPE from by exchanging reception reports with my neighbors. Uh, which piggyback on the data packets in the header introduced between the routing and the MAC layer. That is your coding header. And there are some other fields also which uh, might mention if it is relevant. Uh, but uh, sometimes reception reports may not arrive in time. So, it will use uh, the delivery probability of a node to make some guessing based on link quality whether uh, my neighbor heard the previous transmission or not. So, it is a, a combination of both. So, here is an example taken from the COPE paper. Here is uh, the packets in B's output queue and C and D and A are shown. Uh, and uh, here are the next hops of the packet in, B, uh, of in B's queue. P1 is going to A, P2 to C, P3 to C and P4 to D. Okay? So, let us look at what are the options B has to do the coding. Uh, uh, is P1 plus P2 a valid coding opportunity? Now, P1 is supposed to go to A. So, if A wants to decode, it should have P2, but it does not. So, P1 plus P2 is not valid. What about P1 plus P3? Uh, P1 is going to A, and P, P, uh, A already has P3, so it can recover P1. Similarly, uh, P3 is going to C, and C has P1, so you can recover P3. So, P1 plus P3 is valid. What about P1 plus P3 plus P4? Uh, you can verify uh, P1 has P3 and P4. P1 is going to A. Uh, P3 is going to C, and it has the other two packets, and so on. So that's also valid, but uh, it's better because you are here. You're combining uh, three packets, so you save more transmissions. Okay. Now here are some results. I pulled up two charts from their paper. Uh, they have a wireless mesh network test bed, and the uh, the chart here on the on the left is for TCP. The right is for UDP. It's about a 30-node in-building mesh network testbed, so it's relatively dense. Uh, the flows they have some uh, arrival model for the flows and the packet They do file transfers each file, uh, each flow. Sorry. Is there some assumption about reliable delivery? There's it's a it's an actual mesh network testbed, so it's uh, the link delivery probabilities are not one, and there is MAC layer retransmission. Are you, are you counting the retransmission in these curves? Uh, yes, the curve is plotting. It's the, the curve here is from their paper, so they are plotting the throughput. So that's already taken care of because they're only measuring the rate received at the receivers. So all those uh, retransmissions are taken care of uh, because it's an actual mesh network test rate. How I will do it in my framework, I'll come back to it 
in the second half of the talk. So uh, what they observed here, so here you know, the lower curve is with traditional network routing and the top curve is with network coding. And uh, the rates are, you know, the rates, the scales are not directly comparable because what happens for TCP, uh, they had the hidden terminals problem. Uh, so it, TCP cannot ramp up sufficiently to use the wireless medium uh, because it interprets uh, packet losses due to congestion and backs off. So of TCP, what they did, they brought the nodes close to each other physically uh, to uh, remove the hidden terminals problem, but they simulated the same topology. So they, they simulated the loss rates on the links and they simulated the same topology, the bigger topology. So these x axis not directly comparable, but the relative numbers are comparable. So what they observe is uh, the gains for TTCP compared to coding versus no coding is about 38 percent and the UDP gains are much more, uh, two, to, uh, two to four times. The reason is that TCP uh, does a very good job of congestion control when you don't have uh, packet, uh, wireless related losses. So uh, whereas in UDP it doesn't, so if you, uh, what uh, network coding does, it's able to alleviate congestion in the network by removing, uh, by reducing number of transmissions. So the congestion point of the network is moved further on. So the benefits are UDP is much more uh, because it is not doing anything intelligent uh, to alleviate congestion control. So those are, uh, yes. Be fair to summarize it, just larger queues in the network mean you have more opportunities for network coding? Yes, absolutely. So the reason, uh, yeah, so if you get more packets, you can try to mix more flows, absolutely. Uh, so uh, that's a short summary of COPE. So when we looked at this paper, we asked ourselves, uh, whether the throughput improvements of this COPE type network coding can be explained or predicted within a theoretical framework. And that's the focus of the rest of the talk. So specifically what we would like to do, if we are given uh, 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 the wireless mesh topology with link transmission rates, loss rates, interference range, and so on, and we're given any pattern of concurrent unicast traffic demands and a routing strategy, for example, COPE does shortest path routing on the link metric, whether we can predict what the throughput will be and uh, see if there is agreement with what they have obtained. Now, and there's, uh, so when we tried to come up with this formulation, we had uh, uh, something else came to our mind, that what COPE is doing, it's making the routing oblivious of network coding. But in our formulation, we had routing variables. So why not try to make the routing uh, exploit the coding opportunities rather than remain oblivious to it. So that's the second question here and I'll illustrate in a moment. So what really we want to do, uh, see in wireless mesh networks you first need to take care of interference. So na naturally you would like to route the flows away from each other so that uh, you know, they don't interfere and you can schedule your transmissions and increase throughput. So if you do interference routing, you would want to route them away from each other. But now you have um, the network coding part, which actually prefers that flows route close to each other because then they will meet at the same nodes and there will be more coding opportunities. So there is a classic trade-off here involved that you know, on one side to improve throughput, I want to route flows away from each other for interference avoidance. And here to increase coding benefits, I want to route them close to each other. So that's an interesting optimization problem. Uh, so here is an example of what is close, uh, far away from each other. So here you have a topology and you have one demand from one to four, one demand from four to five. So if you do shortest path routing, here it's shortest hop. The first flow goes like this as shown. Second flow goes four, three, six, five. Okay. So you can see they are routed away from each other. Uh, so there is no coding opportunity. Here it's not there, uh, assuming there is no overhearing. Now in the second scenario, I try to route the uh, four, one four flow on a longer path, but which benefits coding. So now you see the two flows crisscross each other at three and six. 
So you get a coding opportunity according to the first rule. So in particular, if you count number of transmissions, uh, there are six transmissions here. Here, there's seven minus two. Why seven? Because increased by one to take a longer path, and minus two because I'm doing coding here and here. So I save one transmission and convert it to a broadcast. So, so, I'm, so th there is a decrease in number of transmissions. Now, to compare the throughput, you have to do the scheduling, but I'm just showing you for illustration purposes that the transmission decreases. So, uh, so that is also another aspect we will look at, that we want to do the routing in a coding aware manner. Now, so what is the problem formulation? Uh, so we are given the wireless mesh network topology, link transmission rates, uh, delivery probabilities. So I think as at last, we will not assume links are reliable. Uh, and we are given the end-to-end -end data rates. And we want to answer, is this given traffic matrix feasible using coding aware routing? Uh, so we want to do coding aware routing. Maybe with shortest path, it's not feasible. We want to see what's the best possible. So we will uh, generalize the formulation, and we will actually compute the maximum lambda, which we call throughput, so that we can uh, route the matrix multiplied by lambda. It's calling lambda the throughput. And clearly, if you can solve the general problem, you can solve the earlier problem, because traffic is feasible if the lambda obtained is at least 1. Okay? Now, uh, there's some background on the coding work on the problem without network coding. That's your throughput with traditional routing in wireless mesh networks. The paper uh, came out of Microsoft Research, Mobicon 2003. Uh, they talk about the traditional routing problem, Jain, Padhyay, Padmanabhan, and Q. And I will uh, uh, look at transmission scheduling and use some of the ideas in that paper. Uh, but they show that the problem is NP hard even for one SD pair, so, because the difficulty arises from scheduling wireless transmission subject to interference. And what they provide is a linear programming based formulation, where in the worst case, it could be exponential size. Okay. Now, the second part of the talk, uh, the theoretical framework. But uh, before that, let's look at the big picture. A lot of the work for, multi uh, for network coding is for multicast. And there, you can separate the routing and coding problems. What you do, you compute the routing, assuming flow share link capacity. And then you can prove existence of and compute a coding scheme that achieves the throughput of routing. And uh, it's known that uh, linear codes are sufficient. Now, what is happening in, in the case of COPE type unicast network coding? First of all, it's for unicast. Secondly, I'm restricting the family of coding schemes. It's not arbitrarily general. Uh, so in particular, it's XOR based, and it allows each transit node of a packet to decode the packet. And also, uh, you're using the two mechanisms I talked about, including opportunistic uh, listening. So uh, it is, no, the general problem for unicast sessions is open. So if I don't restrict the coding scheme, you know, just like for the multicast case, that problem is open. And it is known that, in general, nonlinear codes may be required. So the hope for now is to look at specific uh, coding schemes for unicast. And the other important difference is now I cannot solve the two problems separately. I solve the routing scheme and independently and then show that the coding scheme can achieve the throughput of routing. I have to do a joint optimization that computes the routing scheme and coding scheme for achieving maximum throughput. So that's the important point here. The approach is a joint optimization Whereas a majority of the earlier approaches for multicast solved the problem separately. Uh, and so, and in addition, I have to do link transmission scheduling also, because it's wireless. So we have uh, three different things to take care of, routing, coding, and link transmission. Okay. Now the roadmap for the rest of the talk. Now, uh, I can't uh, avoid writing equations all together, but I will try to focus on the, on the reasoning and I have some nice diagrams which supposedly will uh, make it easier to follow. But if I lose any of you, please stop me. So I'll first talk about scheduling broadcast transmissions, because in network coding, you are doing broadcast, not unicast. So you need to exploit the broadcast nature. So we'll see how we can extend the framework of the previous Microsoft research paper. Then I will talk about uh, coding-aware routing without opportunistic listening. That's simpler. Then I'll bring in 
opportunistic uh, listening into the framework. We'll talk about some extensions and uh, I'll talk about evaluation on some specific topologies. By evaluation, I mean running the numbers using a framework, not on an actual mesh network aspect. Okay, so that's the second half of the talk. So, okay. so uh, we need to handle broadcast transmissions. So unicast is a special case. Broadcast means no descending to subset of its neighbors. So you know, two things need to be handled. Uh, the transmit receive diversity for a single radio. A node can transmit or receive, but not at the same time. Uh, and also link interference or omit directional antenna. Now we will use the protocol model of interference, which says each node has a communication range and a larger interference range. And during a transmission, the receiver must be free of interference. So it should be, uh, uh, should not be within interference range of another transmitter. Now the approach in this earlier Microsoft paper, they look at scheduling unicast transmissions only. So each node is intending to send to one next stop, the others have to keep quiet. Now uh, the way we extend, we look at a broadcast conflict graph, whereas they do a unicast conflict graph, that's the first thing. And then we will uh, use the broadcast conflict graph to relax the scheduling constraints and convert them to linear link utilization constraints, okay? So let me talk about the broadcast transmission. Uh, okay, now we wanted our framework to be such that we can run some numbers using available data. So uh, these topologies at MIT, uh, both in-building, uh, COOP and this MIT RoofNet, they don't give any broadcast rates. So we have to make some assumption of broadcast rates. But if you plug in the broadcast rates in our model, you could, you know, work with them, but here is one way of doing it, but uh, how you do it does not affect the model. So the, uh, the model here is for each link E, you have a transmission rate, which is the native transmission rate, but there is a delivery probability which is smaller than one for every link. So presumably you have to retransmit on the average one by PE times to do a successful uh, delivery of the next hop. So we work with the effective transmission rate for a link which is a delivery probability times RE. So once we do that, we don't need to model retransmissions because uh, the rate decreases. Now what about for broadcast? Now if, if B is a subset of outgoing links at node I, broadcast means the transmission out of node I supposed to reach everybody in B. Okay? Now suppose uh, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, the broadcast B uh, can be the minimum of the separate unicast rates. Now if we do that, so R of B is the native rate of broadcast, is the minimum rate, native rate of the links in B. Then what is the probability that a single such broadcast will reach all my neighbors in B? That's simply the product of the delivery probabilities of each link, because assume, assuming independence. So then we know the broadcast rate is at least so much, which is the transmission rate multiplied by the overall delivery probability. Now you can probably achieve higher broadcast rates by doing some intelligent retrans uh, retransmission and so on, but uh, for this stock numbers, we will assume U of B is computed in this manner from the data we have already available. So framework, as I said, it does not depend on how U B is obtained. If you give me some U B, I can work with it. Okay. Now coming back to the broadcast conflict graph, so I build a graph where the nodes are uh, uh, tuples i comma b. So what is i? i means the broadcast going out of node i, uh, reaching uh, uh, a set of links, outgoing links b. So b is the subset of links on which I am sending out the broadcast. And r of b is the set of receiver nodes in b. So we will join, we will put an undirected edge between i1, b1 and i2, b2 if there is interference at some receiver. So how is that? The, so either a receiver in B1 is within interference range of I2 or a receiver in B2 is within interference range of I1. So okay, that's the rule for putting a, a conflict edge between the two nodes. And you can verify this includes special cases where it's the same node transmitting to two different broadcast sets and so on. Or the two receiver sets have something in common all that can be verified, okay? So these are the rules. So using these rules, I can build my broadcast conflict graph. 
and then we will add linear scheduling constraints corresponding to cliques or independent sets in the conflict graph. Okay. So, I have some equations here, uh, but I will explain. So, y i b is the broadcast traffic out of node i going on out going links at b. Those are my broadcast variables. So, what I do is I divide y i b by the rate of the effective rate of the broadcast u b and sum over all clicks in the broadcast graph. So, all i comma b nodes which form a click. The intuitive reasoning is if it forms a click every broadcast interferes with every other broadcast. So, they cannot be active at the same time. So, the sum of the utilizations have to be at most 1. And similarly, you can do with uh, independent set constraints. Uh, uh, I will skip them for the interest of time. Uh, the point to note here, the click constraints give an upper bound, which may not be achievable. You might need to add other types of constraints. But your independent set constraints, they give a lower bound, which is achievable. And if you include all independent sets, which is exponential in the worst case, you would get the exact answer. So, I have no way to verify that I got the exact answer. But if I compute an upper bound and a lower bound, and the gap is 10 percent, I can say I am within 10 percent of optimality. And if I am lucky and, and my gaps, uh, they are the, there is no gap, I know I have found the optimal solution. So, in fact, for the topologies we ran, there is no gap. So, uh, we can claim we have the optimal solution. Yeah, but uh, uh, if, if that happens, you are lucky. In general, the ratio between the two gaps is your uh, bound on how much close you are to optimal. Okay. So, that is the broadcast scheduling model that I will use in both my uh, cases here with and without opportunistic listening. So, I will not come back to it anymore. So, now let us focus on the coding part. So, first case is uh, when there is no opportunistic listening. So, their problem is simpler. Any coding opportunity consists of two flows transiting a node in reverse directions. Okay. So, if you have a node i uh, links e 1, e 2, you have uh, flow in one direction, flow in the other. Uh, so, I introduce some notation here. Uh, k is the demand. Uh, S of k is the source of demand k. D of k is the destination node. And T of k is the value of the demand, the end to end rates. We introduce routing variables, f k, the k is the demand, and uh, p is the portion of the demand k, which is routed on path p. Now, I am using path variables, I will come back to them in a moment. Uh, uh, so, this f k of p is amount of traffic out of t k that goes on path p. Okay? And I, rem uh, I have my broadcast variables y i b, but now my b consists of only two links, because I am looking at the special case. So, I want to maximize throughput lambda. So, first of all, I have my simple routing constraints. The sum of the flows for demand k over all paths is lambda times the end to end rate t k. Okay. This is for all demands. The second are the coding constraints. What it means, the amount of traffic I can code in either direction is the minimum of the flow in each direction. Right? So, you are not doing any zero packet padding. So, so then uh, the am amount of coded traffic I can send out on outgoing links E1 and E2 is at most the flow going on the path. Now, the bar is the reverse of a link. So, I showed E1 going out. So, E1 bar is going in. So, it is uh, at most the flow going on going through E1, E2. And similarly, you have another one in the other direction, which I have not shown. You just reverse E1 and E2. So, that is my coding constraints. So, and then you will have one set of constraints for the native traffic, which goes out without any coding. So, that is simply a sum of two components. That is the traffic originating at node i, because originating traffic you cannot code. Uh, no, nobody else has the packet. So, it is the sum of the originating traffic going out of node i through link e, plus the amount of traffic which goes out uh, as native. Uh, uncoded. So, you remember you took the minimum of the two flows. So, uh, the remaining portion goes out as native. So, those are the, that's the constraint here. And then you put it into a big LP. But I think I have gone over the individual constraints. These are my routing constraints. These are my coding constraints, one in each direction. 
uh, this is the native traffic and these are the scheduling constraints. So that's my big LP for the case without opportunistic listening. Now here our routing, any, any questions on the formulation? Okay. Uh, so the routing variables, uh, I use path variables, uh, but you can actually convert them to dual link index variables because it only matters in what is coming in and what is going out, that incoming outgoing link. So you can have a polynomial number of uh, dual link variables, uh, fk, e1, e2, that's the, the portion of the flow that is incoming and outgoing at uh, link e1, e2 at node i. And uh, you can look at it as routing on a uh, graph with a node splitting transformation, where every node you break up into you know, a, a set of incoming links, nodes, and it's outgoing, and it's like a bipartite graph for each node. So you can do the transformation and have a polynomial number of routing variables. But the scheduling, you can't do much because that's an NP-hard problem. Now in practice, we found this path index formulation runs fine because we solved the LPs using CPLEX uh, uh, on a PC. So e for example, instead of including, you know, if the paths are exponential in the worst case, too many paths to slow down your LP, you can uh, re re restrict the set of paths for uh, demand K to the k-shortest paths based on some wireless uh, routing link metric. And we found that uh, you know, if you choose for, typically you have 30, 40, 50 node topologies, if you have choose a few tens of paths, it runs fine. It finds the optimal solution and it uses actually a small number of paths. Too, too many long paths will actually uh, decrease throughput. So, because, uh, so here uh, you are okay with using path variables also from a running point running time point of view. So that's the part without opportunistic listening. This is uh, the part for modeling opportunistic listening and then I will go on to some of the results. Here uh, you can overhear two types of packets, uh, coded packet or native packet. Now the coding rule guarantees that only the intended next stop can decode a coded packet. If somebody else is hearing a coded packet and it wasn't intended for itself, it may or may not be uh, decodable. Uh, the scheme does not provide any guarantees. So in fact, how the COPE system runs, if I receive a coded packet which is not for me, I don't look at it anymore. So we had to make a conservative assumption that uh, if you hear a coded packet not intended for you, uh, you know, you, uh, opportunistic listening doesn't help. Uh, most of the time you won't be able to decode it, okay? So the only way opportunistic listening can be helpful is if I hear a native packet. So that's the first assumption here. I mean, you can mo try to model the exact thing, you will have a lot of variables in your LP, it will grow even larger. So we made this uh, realistic assumption. Now, so what on what does the coding opportunity depend? The so two factors, incoming outgoing links at a node and whether the packet was received as coded or native. So here's an example. You have uh, flow going from 3 to 1 through node 2, okay? 3 to 1. And you are having a flow going from 4 to 3, 4 to 3. Now, if you see at node 2, it receives both the packets. One is going out to 1 other is going out to th 3. If the transmission at 4 was native, then it was overheard at 1. So you can mix the two packets, exhort them, and do a broadcast. If the transmission at 4 was a coded transmission, there is no guarantee that uh, one can de decode it. So in which case, uh, the overhearing may not be useful. So it, 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 and we assume it is not. So it depends on whether the transmission which is overheard is native or coded. So we need to now maintain extra variables in our LP to keep track of whether a transmission is native or coded in order to utilize the second type of coding opportunity. So which implies coding decision at a node is dependent on coding decisions of neighboring nodes. So it makes the problem um, more challenging. So we need to model these uh, coding opportunities now, uh, uh, in a more detailed manner. So what we define here uh, is a coding structure. So what is a coding structure at node i? It will capture 
the possible useful coding opportunities. So, in particular, it is a set of two tuples, where the first coordinate of the tuple says whether what is the incoming link and outgoing link of the packet, and the second uh, coordinate indicates whether uh, the transmission was received as uh, native or coded. Okay. So, here is an example. If you go, go back to the first scenario, 3 is sending to 1, 1 is sending to 3, here you are not using opportunistic li listening. So, coded native does not matter. So, my coding opportunity is for, for the packets in the forward direction 1, 2, 3, they are coming in on 1, going out on 2, first coordinate and native or coded does not matter. And for the other direction, it is uh, bar is the reverse. Uh, e2 is coming coming in on E2 reverse, going out E1 reverse, and it could be native or coded. So it's two possible coordinates here, two possible coordinates here. You actually get four pairs. Okay, for for uh, th this example, the example makes sense. Uh, coding opportunity. So here is a different uh, example. Here uh, your flow is going one, four to three, and five to one. So you. Uh, incoming is uh, E1, E2, which is here, and it has to be native because it has to be overheard at 1. Similarly, here uh, it is E3, E4, has to be native because it must be overheard at 3. So, here there is no flexibility on the second coordinate. So, that is another coding opportunity. So, in, in general, if you give me a, a set of two tuples, as a member of S, I can verify easily whether it is valid or not by going over the coding rule. So, that is my definition of a coding structure which models a coding opportunity. So, uh, let me define gamma i to be the set of valid coding of structures at node i. There could be many. So, basically S is a representation for uh, how the packets are coded. Now, what are the number of possible tuples? at node i. So, E 1 and E 2, uh, if the node i has degree d i, uh, e, e, E 1 is d i possible choices, E 2 d i minus 1 and the two, two values here, n or c, you have 2 d i into d i mi minus 1 possible uh, tuples at a node i. And the coding opportunity is a subset of these tuples. Uh, so, what we do is we take a simple approach and so, so here you could you could try to come up with a efficient algorithm to gen generate all the valid coding structures, but because d i is small in wireless mesh, we just took a simple enumeration approach. We are not focusing on how we are generating the structures, because the running time of the LP does not depend on how you generate the structure. So, you can try to speed up uh, the process uh, by coming up with something more intelligent. So, you've, you look at all valid coding structures. So, how will you uh, know it is valid? You All the next hops in S must be distinct and uh, each next stop should be able to decode the packet. So, the simple example I gave here, the two examples, you know, if you give me any coding structure, I can verify whether it follows the coding rule. So, you, you, using that, I have all the valid coding structures and they will correspond to variables in my LP. Um, I also use some more notation, B of S is the broadcast link associated with coding structure S. So, basically here, the broadcast links here are E2 and E1 bar. Here it is uh, E4 and E2. Okay. A question. Um, looking at this uh, formulations, yes. um, when I look at total code opportunity at a certain node, yes. it seems to me that uh, uh, bound proportional to 2 n square, which may be in the level of neighbor node around the node, right? Because I mean, basic E1 and E2. Yes. Um, I mean, if I have n neighbors, yes. this E1, E2 pair selection is about n, n square divided by E2. Yes. Right. And then you have n c that's four status yes. per edge. Uh, this is a coding opportunity where you consider two links. In your previous example, you show an example of um, where you can consider three links. With more, yeah. Right. So then you could have any, in general, you could have any subset of these two n square tuples, but many of them will not be valid because yeah. the next hops must be distinct. 
So, and because in uh, wireless mesh topology, a degree is small, you know, in general, if you have a set of size 2n square, this 2 to the power of 2n square possible subsets, but many of them will be eliminated because next hops must be distinct and still more because they are not valid coding opportunities. So, at the end, uh, you hopefully will get, get a much smaller number which is manageable. And you could uh, look at uh, you know, a way to come up with these structures intelligently, but because the degree is small, just enumerating them and eliminating them looks fine. So, you basically uh, choose according to the first rule and eliminate according to the second rule. Well, that is what we did. Uh, now, the LP running time does not depend on if you can speed this up. Uh, so, we did not spend too much time trying to figure out how to efficiently generate all of them. Yes. So, does this formulation, so, so, so in, your, in your simulations, did you also check the, do the simulation numbers include the, the potential gain from coding a packet that, that will be overheard at three listeners simultaneously? Yes, yes. So, uh, the, the coding scheme here, you could, uh, you could, if a degree or node 5, node as degree 5, you could code up to 5 packets. Because each packet has to go on a distinct outgoing link. So, we are not a priori upper bounding the number of flows participating, packets participating in XOR. Right. So, the tuple here is about the links, not about the, and then the tuples get combined in the subsets. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. So, now I have to introduce some extra variables, which are two types of variables. I have to track, as I said, whether a transmission is native or coded. So, I introduced the z variables, which says portion of traffic on path p for demand k that is transmitted as native from node i. The remaining part is uh, 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 transmitted as coded. Second is with each coding structure s at node i, uh, x i of s is the traffic associated with coding structure s. So, which means if I combine three flows, each has one unit. Uh, of rate, then the x i s will also have one unit of rate, because I am coding and packet sizes remain the same. So, if there are three flows participating in a structure, each flow associated with s is also contributing one unit. Now, I have a schematic to make things simpler. So, uh, even if the equations are hard to follow, uh, the main reasoning is in the diagram here. So, what I am doing is, uh, I am looking at node i and trying to track the transit traffic entering at E 1 and outgoing at E 2. And I can do it for each other E 1, E 2 pairs. Okay? For now, let us focus on one E 1, E 2 pair. So, here the node is re, uh, for the flows on E 1, E 2, it is receiving two types of packets. The gray packets are native received packets, yellow packets are the coded received packets. The gray, gray packets, their number you know, it is the total traffic, uh, total traffic broad packets broadcast as native from the T of E 1 is the transmission side of E 1. So, by the previous node on the head of E 1 uh, and I sum over all flows which go, go through E 1, E 2. That is sum over all paths which contain E 1, E 2 and uh, the packets coming as coded received are just the whole minus the amount received as native. Remember this f k of p routing variables, so they are total number of packets. So, two types of packets are com coming in. Now, out of the gray packets coming in, some of them get coded up in structures with the second coordinate as native, because they are the native packets. Similarly, for the yellow packets, some of them get coded up in the structures which contain c as the second coordinate. So, and the remaining, uh, they are uncoded, so they go out as native packets. So, I can express these total quantities in terms of my defined LP variables. Uh, so, here this is sigma x i s over all s containing E 1, E 2 n as a uh, tuple. Similarly, here containing E 1, E 2 c as a tuple and the total coming out as native is simply uh, z i k p uh, that is going out of node i as uh, native and p should contain e 1, e 2. So, that is my schematic. All the equations come out of the schematic. So, if the schematic makes sense, what I say next will be easy. So, 
looking at the schematic, the total coded traffic coming out is at most the total gray packets entering, right? So that's my first equation. The total uh, coded traffic going out is at most uh, the total coming in. My second equation is for the yellow packets. Total coded traffic going out is at most the total coded here coming in. That's my sorry. Uh, that's my second equation, coding constraint for coded receive packets. And the last constraint is uh, just a flow balance. What is coming in is what's going out. So sum of this plus this equal to sum of this plus this plus this. Okay? So I have three types of constraints. One for gray packets, one for yellow packets, one for total ba balance. So that's my third equation. So even if they look intimidating, I hope I've made the reasoning uh, clear. Okay, now, so that is all about my coded traffic. Now I have to de define the scheduling variables. So uh, the scheduling variables when B is only one link, that's my native traffic. And that is the total traffic I can express in terms of the, uh, uh, the native traffic variables at node I. And then uh, the coded traffic I can express in terms of the values of the coding structure variables, and there the broadcast set is at least two, the native with size one. So those are my uh, uh, scheduling constraints. And then I put everything together, my routing variables, my uh, uh, gray, uh, gray packets, my yellow packet constraints, total, then these are the boundary conditions for the native variables, they are easy, so I skip them. And the last two are, what is the flow on going out on unicast and broadcast, and the last one is the click scheduling. So that's my big LP. So that's solving the problem for with opportunistic listening. So what are some extensions? Uh, here my routing variables were uh, continuous variables, FKP. If you want to do integral routing, uh, shortest path, with, uh, so you have to, uh, uh, the second one, you have to use integer routing variables and you can, if you re restrict your paths to a few, you know, they will, and if you're fast machine running CPLEX, it may run reasonably fast. You have to do, do some variable transformation to remove non-linearity, but it works out. Uh, the second thing you can do, if you are running this, uh, so uh, what is network coding doing? It is reducing number of transmissions. So I am exploiting that to increase throughput, multiplying by lambda. Instead, if it's a wireless sensor network, nodes are running on batteries, I can use, uh, I can uh, save transmissions, uh, not increase throughput, but conserve battery li life. So uh, my lambda is one, but now I want to conserve battery life. So in that context, you might want to minimize the total rates of all the broadcasts, because every broadcast is consuming the battery power. So you might want to uh, minimize the total uh, broadcast transmission bandwidth. Okay. In general, if it's any linear objective function, you can handle it because it's an LP. Okay. So those are two extensions. Uh, the last part of the talk, uh, I think I am about uh, 55 minutes. So uh, the last part of the talk, we did some evaluations. Now, we have uh, two types of topologies. We took, took a 14-node toy topology to uh, uh, give some intuition on what's happening. There's a 15-node random topology. We took a squared grid and put some nodes at random uh, and put enough nodes to make the topology connected. And then there are two real-world topologies. This is a 32-node in-building mesh, and this is a 31-node uh, community wireless mesh. The in in-building mesh is pretty dense. The wireless mesh, its community, it's sparse. Okay, so that's why we chose one dense, one sparse. Now, what are the things we want to evaluate? Uh, first of all, is no coding. Uh, it, the routing is only interference aware, and that's the method from the earlier Microsoft paper. Uh, so we look at S path, which is shortest path ETX routing, and when do the multipath routing according to the Microsoft paper. So this is shortest path, some link metric. This is the Microsoft paper. The, sec uh, the next two cases are with coding. So 
uh, and there I can vary. I can turn off opportunistically listening or I can turn it on. And S path code here, you are doing shortest path routing as in the COPE paper. So it's coding oblivious. And now I want to uh, plug in the LPs in th this work and do coding aware routing and multipath. So CA is coding aware, M path is multipath. I just shortened it to LP code. LP means the LP is developed in this paper. Okay, so those are the things I want to look at. And uh, uh, I am not doing this on actual test bed. These are all numbers output from calculations, LPs, and so on. Okay. So here is a 14 node toy topology. So yeah, I'm showing you the node coordinates here on the XY plane. A communication range is 100, interference range is 200. All ring lengths are demands one unit. In scenario A, I'm sending one demand from zero to four. And a second demand from 10 to 13. So if you do shortest path routing, demand one will go on 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if you do shortest path routing, demand 2 will go on 10, 11, 12, 13. So you have these uh, four links and three links. And you can show they are all within interference range of each other. So your throughput of shortest path routing is 1, 7. Okay. Now you can do uh, single path routing, but which is not shortest path. And then what happens is the longer the flow from 0 to 4, it goes on P3. So you can uh, uh, do away with interference from P1. So throughput is increased to 2 by 9. So interference aware routing, as I said, you try to route them away from each other. So now I'm scenario B. Now, now you can see here there are no coding opportunities because the flows are not crisscrossing each other. Okay, That's scenario A. In scenario B, to bring uh, network coding into the picture, I will reverse the direction of the uh, first flow. So instead of 0 to 4, I'll go 4 to 0, and the second flow is same, 10 to 13. Now, if you do shortest path, your lambda is 1 fifth. Now, shortest path with no coding. Uh, here, so here, uh, your uh, sh the 4 to 0, it goes 4, 3, 2, 1, and the 10 to 13 goes at, as b before. Your throughput is 1 by 7, no coding opportunities. Yes? The workload. I mean, I mean, this trade-off you're mentioning between coding and interference aware routing. It yes. seems to arise only when, like, you know, there are not too many flows in the network, right? I mean, if there are like, you know, networks being used and stuff, I mean, there would always be flows going in both directions. Yeah, but uh, as I will show in the numbers, uh, even if there are a lot of flows, uh, change in the routing in coding aware manner can bring out benefits. So I will talk about uh, more demands in the next few slides. Okay. Because uh, if you can change the routing, it will lead to more coding opportunities. Well, it depends on the scenario, but the numbers, uh, I'll come to them in the next few slides. Here, I uh, just showed two flows for kind of understanding what's going on. Get a feel. Okay. Uh, now, if you do network coding, uh, the formulation in this presentation, but uh, let's say, uh, to keep things simple, we don't do multipath. We do single path. Then what happens? The second flow takes a longer path, 10, 1, 2, 3, 13. And you will now have coding opportunities at nodes 1, 2, and 3. So your throughput increases to 1 fourth. Okay. So that's the toy topology. Now here is a 15 node random topology, and average degree is 4.4. Here, if, if you, uh, and here I'm increasing the number of demands. And here I am uh, plotting the throughput gain compared to traditional routing. So here I am getting, in general, as you increase the number of flows, your coding opportunities increase. So your gain will increase. And uh, for uh, the, the gain over traditional routing is about 65%. And the gain over coding oblivious routing is 40%. That's what we obtain for this topology. So maybe some part of that uh, question, if you have more demands, routing can make a difference if you have coding going on. I have some more examples. Here we took a 32 node in-building mesh. Degree is relatively high, 6.8. So here, without opportunistic listening, uh, I have put down the gains here. Gain over traditional routing for shortest path, 
and uh, shortest path with coding, uh, not coding aware. And LP code is coding aware routing. The gains are 80 percent, 18 and 32. But if you add in opportunistic listening, 18 percent becomes 61 percent and 32 percent becomes 72 percent. Okay. Uh, the important point here is this is a, a dense topology. So opportunistic listening makes a difference. If it's sparse, it may not as in the uh, second example. Uh, here a uh, third example, uh, 31 node community wireless mesh. This is a relatively sparse. So here if you see if you go from no opportunistic listening to opportunistic listening, uh, the gains are not that much, 26 percent to 35, 40 percent to 45. So here I have plotted, tried to show what is the mix of structures using opportunistic listening and not using. So I have uh, the, the dense topology here, sparse topology here. Here I am plotting the fraction of traffic that is uh, contributed by the opportunistic li listening structure that is SOL and SNOL is the contribution from the no opportunistic listening structures. So for the dense topology uh, and for uh, both coding oblivious and coding aware routing, you will see the contribution is much more from the opportunistic listening structures. They will sum to 1 because uh, uh, taking 1 as a fraction of the total. So here the contribution for both cases is from the more from the opportunistic listening structures. Whereas in the community wireless topology where the it is sparse, the contribution is opposite more from the structures with no overhearing and if you do uh, overhearing opportunistic listening, the contribution is much smaller and the throughput improvement is not much. So opportunistic listening has a overhead, right? You have to maintain track reception reports and all that. So what comes out of this is, if you if it makes sense to do opportunistic listening, only if uh, the network is sufficiently dense. And because we have this framework, even before you deploy your network, you can come up with uh, some calculations and see whether it makes sense, what is the benefit, and so on. And if there is not much benefit, it may not be worth it. Now, a few concluding slides. Uh, so as I said, uh, the benefits for coding aware routing over traditional routing, they are in the range of 40 to 70 percent and uh, over coding oblivious routing 20 to 45 percent and tense network favors opportunistic listening and coding aware routing helps when many paths are available. When you do not have many paths available, you know, uh, there are few choices to begin with. So it may not help. Uh, in summary, we presented a theoretical understanding of a practical network coding scheme like COPE. So uh, given the network topology, link transmission rates, loss rates and interference range, any traffic pattern, unicast, uh, we showed a method of doing joint optimization that computes routing scheme and coding scheme as well as scheduling your transmissions, the achieving maximum throughput. And we also did uh, joint interference aware and coding aware routing. So there is an interesting trade-off involved there when you add network coding. Uh, reported some evaluation results uh, by running the LPs and we obtained uh, throughput gains uh, over traditional routing in the range uh, 1.4x to 1.7x and for coding oblivious routing, uh, so we compare coding aware routing over coding oblivious, that is uh, 1.2 to 1.45. Now what we want to do to take this work forward, all the numbers are in the theoretical framework and what COPE has done is run num things on actual test bed. What we want to do is uh, investigate how much of these, uh, the benefits of coding aware routing actually translate in a real mesh network test bed. So when we wrote this paper, the COPE source code was not available, but now it has uh, been made public last month. So uh, my collaborators at Wisconsin, they have a wireless mesh network test bed. So we would like to take the COPE source code and run at least what the other guys already have. And then we want to export the routes computed by our LP to the uh, test bed and see whether how much of in a practice the gap is improvement is for doing coding aware routing versus coding oblivious routing. So that is uh, one item on the agenda. Uh, Secondly, the framework uh, 
you know, is an offline centralized framework. Uh, you might want to extend it to a distributed online routing framework where the flows arrive over time. So there we have some ideas on a link metric that takes network coding into consideration. And uh, uh, there, there's also uh, some other possibilities. Here you pin down the route at the source. Maybe you can make some local de decision on the next stop also. So the coding and the routing can be folded into a local decision. You have to, of course, uh, worry about not having loops and all that. But there is some possibility of folding the routing and coding into the local node decision. Third, uh, the MAC layer model I talked about, it assumes perfect scheduling. But in practice, uh, you know, as, as you have more nodes, there is some time spent doing contention resolution. So we want to see if uh, we can model some of that uh, for actual 802.11 Mac and see how the bounds change. Uh, so that's uh, for future work. And that's all I have. Uh, Oh, okay. Thanks very much for the talk. <laughs>